He played the keyboard? The guy is too talented. I'd give anything to play the guitar, and then I'd give anything more to play a keyboard. And you guys are good on the bass and drums. Guitar, thank you. Leading us in worship. Well, today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We have some roses here. And we're going to give those out to the mothers. So in a moment, I'm going to ask the mothers to come up and we're going to pray for you. But I want to read something that was written back in the 1800s. Uh, when you go way back then, you realize the culture is a little different than it is today. So it was pretty common for uh, men to honor their mothers and to mention not only how they influenced and loved them growing up, but how they invested them spiritually. So here's what W.L. Caldwell wrote back in the 1800s. May we pause to pay honor to her who, after Jesus Christ, is God's best gift to men and children, mothers. It was she who shared her life with us when we were yet unborn. Into the valley of the shadow of death she walked, that we might have life. In her arms is where we were comforted. There we nestled in the hour of pain. There was the playground of our infant glee. Those same arms later became our refuge and stronghold. It was she who taught our feet to go and lifted us up over the rough places. Her blessed hands worked with sewing needles to make our clothes. And maybe that's changed a little bit. But back then, <laughs> the, the uh, mothers made clothes for their kids. She put the book under our arm and started us off to school. But best of all, she taught our lips to lisp the name of Jesus and told us first the wondrous story of a Savior's love. So thank you, moms, for modeling that. I know our culture... A lot of moms don't tell their kids about Jesus or tell the wondrous story of a Savior. But I know there are moms that do. And so we want to honor you that see it important enough to come to church, to model that to all of us, to be faithful. And so in honor of your moms, can you come up? Anyone who's a mom, come up and you can stand up here and I want to give you a rose. Come on. Can I, well, I'll just give you one. And then if you just stand over here a moment, because I'm going to pray for you. And then, bow, and happy Mother's Day. Yes, you're welcome. Yes. One more mom, I'm told. Now, come on. I've got a special rose for you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Well, let me pray for you, okay? And we're all going to join as if you're praying with me, all right, for these moms. Father in heaven, we do give you thanks for each of these moms. Uh, we can't imagine the hours they spent uh, getting ready for their child to be born or their children to be born. And then the hours, the pain that they went through, through childbirth, and then taking care of that, those babies as they grew up. Lord, I just give you thanks for the way that they uh, model to us what love is all about. Loving unconditionally. Even though kids sometimes don't cooperate, yet they continue to love. And I thank you for their faithfulness to keep loving their kids. Even though kids uh, sometimes don't do what we want, I, I pray that you'll give them grace and strength, and use them for your glory. And I pray that uh, as we listen to the message this morning, they'll become like Hannah, a great model of a godly woman, a godly mother. So Lord Jesus, bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Great, thank you. That wasn't too painful, was it? Yeah, each one give a speech. <laughs> Now there's some extra roses here. If you want to give your mom a rose at, after the service, you can come up and grab one of these to give to your mom as a way of saying thank you. You know, there's a lot of examples in Scripture 
about the importance of motherhood. In fact, we're told over and over again how important God designed moms to take care of their kids and to be examples to their kids. Let me give you some uh, quotes of scripture. Paul said to Titus in the New Testament, godly women are to teach young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, and to be keepers of the home, and to be kind. I think that's interesting. Paul mentioned that, and to be kind. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.10, a widow was one who was well known for her good deeds, and she raises her children up to be godly, a godly generation. That's God's standard. He wants moms to raise up the next generation in a godly way. In the Old Testament, Sarah was a gift to Abram. And even though she was old, she still had faith to believe God was going to fulfill his promise. And then God did give Sarah a, a baby. Uh, but she is a model of faith. There's Rachel, is another example of a mom in the Old Testament. As she was giving birth to Ben-Oni, she died during childbirth, but she was able to say in her last breath, I want to name him Benoni, which means child born in grief. And then there's Jochobed, uh, Jochebed, who was Moses' mom. Remember, she was so afraid that Moses was going to get killed. He was a little baby, so she put him in the river, but protected him in a, in a little basket. And then Miriam found the baby. Uh, or saw the, the woman who found the baby, and then Miriam took care of uh, helping Moses to grow up. Moses was a hero of the faith. Then there's Deborah. She was called to be the mother of Israel. Ruth was a person who had a real gentle and sweet disposition, and she's mentioned in Scripture as someone who gave birth to Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And down through those descendants came Jesus. So through that line of descendants, starting with Ruth. And then there was Elizabeth. She gave birth to probably the greatest preacher who ever lived, John the Baptist. And a fiery guy, but uh, Elizabeth is mentioned in Scripture as one who was sweet and gracious as a mother. And then, of course, we have Mary, who gave birth to Jesus. And there's a lot said in the New Testament about how gracious and pure and gentle and godly Mary was. So... Over and over again, we see examples of mothers throughout Scripture and how important that role is. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about mothers, but men, you're not going to be left out because we have a role in all this. And young people, you're going to be a dad one day, and you're going to have to take care of your wife. And young ladies, you're going to be a mom someday, and you'll, you'll be celebrated as mother. Look, they're starting to bring blankets to church. What does that say? I'm going to get cozy. <laughs> I understand. Uh, so, examples in Scripture. But I want to look at one example that really stands out. In fact, there's probably more said about Hannah and how her motherhood, uh, the details about her being a mother, than any other mother in Scripture. It's pretty interesting. You have to go back to the uh, book of 1 Samuel to find the uh, example of um, Hannah given in Scripture there. The background to this amazing story of a godly mother in 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at that whole chapter, so we're going to keep moving. Uh, if you have a Bible, open your Bible to 1 Samuel. It's an ex amazing example of a godly mother. Now the background to what's going on here is Hannah happened, uh, the book of 1 Samuel, and when Hannah, the story of Hannah is told during the period of the judges. So Israel didn't have kings yet. There were still no kings in Israel, but the judges were the ones who were kind of leading the nation. So no kings. It was a time of turmoil and confusion. People were upset. They wanted a king, somebody who would lead them. They were being taunted by the Philistines. So the enemy was close at the border. Uh, uh, saying that they were going to attack soon. Israel was morally broken. In fact, the priests at that time were so involved in, in evil stuff that God was pretty much done with the priesthood uh, during that day. And then 
a great man comes forth, and his name is Samuel. And Samuel is the guy who kind of leads the charge on putting Israel back on path, on the right path. Samson had died. The country was divided. There was no leader. The Philistines were ready to attack. The priests were corrupt. All moral uh, scandals were going on among the families of the priests. The nation was weak. And then in verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, 1 Samuel 3, 1 says, The word from the Lord was rare in those days, and there were no visions from God. So God had pretty much said, Okay, you people, you're just out of control. And I'm not even going to talk to you. I'm not going to give you visions or, or rem reminders that I'm here to take care of you. The nation needed a leader. And so God uses a woman to conform this young leader who, into a, a man that he's going to be, and that's Samuel. Samuel was one of the greatest men ever to walk on this earth. He became a leader because of what God did in his life, but also what his mom did in helping him to grow up to be a godly, a godly man. So we start in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, there's a bunch of names here. They're going to sound a little crazy here, but here's what it says. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, and the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, and the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. Here's what I want you to notice. This guy, Elkanah, had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Panina. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. So that kind of lays the groundwork, uh, the introduction of this story. This guy, Elkanah, was married to two women, Panea and Hannah. By the way, Hannah means grace. So <laughs> that word describes what kind of lady she was. She was a lady who was gracious and gentle and kind and thoughtful. There are three things that give us an example of a godly number, a godly mother. Those three things we're going to look at this morning. She had a right relationship with her husband. She had a right relationship with God. And she had a right relationship in her home. So those are the three main principles that we're going to look at together. First, she had a right relationship with her husband. I believe the most important relationship is between a husband and a wife because it not only brings harmony into the home and it, it makes a stead, uh, steady or, or a stable family, but when the kids are brought up in that kind of environment, the kids then flourish. There's, there's not this anxiety and worry about what's going to happen with mom and dad. So the right relationship between a mother and, and uh, her husband is so vitally important. Children learn how to be patient when they watch how their parents are patient with one another. They learn about forgiveness when they see the mother asking forgiveness from the father or vice versa. They learn how to understand another point of view, which happens among uh, married people. There's going to be conflict. So children learn how that conflict is resolved when they watch in the home. And they learn about honesty and integrity uh, living in, ch in front of each other with transparency. So the kids are watching, and that's going to help those kids to develop. Um, now, I don't know what kind of home you grew up in, and maybe you didn't see those kinds of things, but God wants us to learn something this morning that is going to help us become the kind of people that He desires us to be. So uh, this message is for all of us, not just for mothers or those who grew up in a real stable home. So we begin the story in 1 Samuel tells us about this relationship between Hannah and Elkanah, her husband. First of all, let me say, it wasn't a perfect relationship. There is no marriage that is perfect. There's always going to be problems. And the problem between Hannah and her husband was he was a polygamist. I mean, he had two wives. Now that's tough when it, it, it seems to suggest that he married Hannah first, but she wasn't having children. And so he goes off and finds another wife that's going to give him children. How would you feel if you were Hannah? Like, oh man, I mean, I'm doing my best. What can I do? What more can I do? Then he goes off and takes another woman, Panina, to be his wife. 
So it's a hurtful, hurtful situation. But in spite of that, Elkanah was a guy who wanted to please God. So maybe for us today, it just doesn't make sense. How could he want to please God and yet have a couple of wives? We've got to understand back in those days, it was part of the culture that men had more than one wife. That doesn't mean it was right. God desires that a man has one wife. But culture does influence. And the thing is that it sometimes takes a few generations for God to be able to turn that culture around in the way that he desires it to become. Because uh, it can be a tangled mess when there's a, a number of wives involved and how do the children relate and all of that. Uh, so that was the situation with Hannah married to Elkanah. The first thing I think that will help us to see uh, what kind of guy this guy was, uh, Elkanah, that he was a godly man, even though he messed up in this area of polygamy, uh, he did worship God. Now it's interesting that when we look at this story, Elkanah, he goes to the temple three times a year to worship God, but then the priest has two sons. The two sons are named Hophni and Phineas. Uh, Phineas, I guess it would be pronounced. Hophni and Phineas. Now these two guys were crooks. These guys were the worst. And here the priest, Eli, had these two sons that were part of the priesthood. And yet these guys were so corrupt that uh, you, you begin to wonder, Eli, couldn't you do a better job? I mean, look what Hannah did in the midst of her circumstance. She was able to live a life that influenced the next generation. However, Eli couldn't do that. So we have this guy, Elkanah, who is a guy who desires to worship God. And that's the first principle I want us to notice, that Hannah had a good relationship with her husband, the right kind of relationship with her husband, because they had a right relationship that they shared in worship. Elkanah often went to the temple to worship. Young ladies, when you're going to have to look for a guy to get married to, look for a guy who has the habit of going to worship, who wants to please God. Because if you don't, that's going to mess up a whole lot in your life and in your marriage and in raising your kids. In fact, over and over the scripture tells us, don't marry a non-Christian. So if you're a Christian, now if you're a non-Christian, go ahead and marry. But as if a Christian marries a non-Christian, it creates problems because then when the kids start growing up, do you take them to church or don't you take them to church? Do you celebrate Easter or don't you? How are you going to celebrate Christmas or don't, aren't you? So there's issues that have to be worked out. So God, in his wisdom, gives counsel that we're not to marry outside the Christian faith. Now, may, maybe somebody that you know did marry an unbeliever, and that's fine. They've become a Christian or they're, they're on their way to to following Christ, and that process is something that uh, the Christian can help his spouse or her spouse become. But the, the counsel of God is that uh, marry those who have the same faith as you. A relationship that has a shared interest in worship says a lot to our kids when they're growing up. Be faithful to make God's word a priority in your life. Be faithful to pray often so your kids hear you pray. Be faithful to affirm what you believe. We believe in this. We believe in Jesus Christ. That he died and he rose again. Our attitude and our actions and spiritual things in our home is going to communicate a lot to our kids and to our grandkids. So a shared interest or a shared uh, priority of worship. Second principle. Well, here's the, here's the verse. 1 Samuel 1, 3. Every year... Elkanah would go up from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Now it says every year. That doesn't mean once a year. There was actually three times in a year that they had to go and provide the, or do this sacrifice. Uh, there were three feasts that they always committed to going and making these sacrifices at the temple. So we can assume that Elkanah was faithful in doing that showing that he was a man who prioritized worship. Second principle, they had a right relationship because they shared love. In 1 Samuel 1.4, it says, Whenever the day came 
for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife. So part of the sacrifice, the priest would give back to those who brought the, the sacrifice. So this meat was given back to Elkanah, and he would give some to Pania, his wife, and to her sons and daughters. But then to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her. I think it's interesting that uh, he, it's so, it, it, we were told that he, he loved Hannah in a very special way. And so he, he shows that love. He expresses that love. Apparently he didn't love Panina quite as much. Even though she had kids, she needed more meat. Panina was there to produce the children. Hannah couldn't have children. Panina was there to create a future for his family, or his inheritance. But Hannah was the one he loved, and he made every attempt to show her how much he loved her. He didn't hide that love. He expressed it. He'd give a double portion to Hannah because she was the one he loved. Now, it was customary in that culture that if you loved somebody or you wanted to honor somebody, you gave that extra portion. So she, he was showing, she, uh, he was honoring her, but she was very special to him. And you know, guys, those of us that are married, it's important that we show our love. Because when we express our love and show our love by actions, it allows our wife to feel secure in the relationship. If we're kind of quiet and we're passive in that expressing that love, our wife will, will begin to feel a little bit anxious, like there's not a strength and security in that relationship. Men, express that love. Show your, your love to your wife. She's not interested in how big your bank account is. Well, maybe some are. But <laughs> how big your house is or... Uh, how important you are at your job. She wants to know she's loved. So men do that often. A woman finds her security in your love to her. So they shared worship. They shared love. And the third principle, they had a right relationship because they shared feelings. 1 Samuel 1, verses 6 and 8 says this. Hannah's rival, that's Panina, this other wife, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. So at every gathering, at every family get-together, at every meal, Panina would kind of look across the table and go, oh, Hannah, it's so sad you don't have any kids. Oh, it's just terrible. Isn't it just, oh, I'm so sorry for you. How the, it's like stabbing the knife in her every time this subject came up. And Hannah, it was, she could get irritated and mad and stomp off, but instead, she lived with quiet anguish, it says in Scripture. We're going to see that in a moment. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival, Panina, provoked her. Till she wept and she couldn't eat. She just felt so sad and so, so beaten. Elkanah noticed his wife was hurting. Now, men, here's something we can learn. Sometimes we're so busy doing our thing or we see our wife, her feelings getting upset. It's like we ignore that and we just want, hey, come on, you know, chill, chill out. But instead, Elkanah took the time and said, are you okay? What's going on? How can I help you? So there was a, sens a sensitivity in Elkanah as he was watching his wife experience this terrible thing as Panina mocked her husband and say, why are you doing this? I'm trying to celebrate. Come on. Get your act together. It wasn't like that at all. It was a much gentle approach. Guys, we need to be sensitive to our wives when they're hurting, when they're struggling. I'll tell you a quick story. When we were living in Asia, I was traveling a lot. And I would go to Myanmar and Vietnam and Cambodia, Laos sometimes. I'd go to India or Middle East. And I'd come home and I didn't even listen to what was going on in Barb's life, like she was taking care of Rob or helping the kids get off to school or what were the kids been doing okay at school. It was like, I just want to talk about, oh man, this trip to Vietnam was awesome, we did this and I saw that. And I, and I wouldn't even listen to her side. And it was, I wasn't being sensitive to what she was going through. Finally, somebody said to me, Tom, when you come back from a trip, you need to take time to ask your wife what's going on. Find out what's happening, what, how she's feeling. 
what struggle she's going through. Don't just be so uh, preoccupied with your own, yourself. And so I had to learn that lesson so that I could become more like, like Elkanah. And I'm still not there, but I'm learning. So, why is Hannah such a godly woman? I'll tell you. The soil of her marriage was such that she could flourish. She was secure with her husband. She, she didn't have any doubt that he loved her. And so in that environment, she was able to grow because they shared worship together. Probably the deepest emotion that can be experienced is worshiping God together. They shared love together. That's probably the second deepest emotion that can be experienced in life. And they shared feelings, sensitive to one another, which is another deep emotion or dimension of life. So they had this deep relationship going on. They experienced in the presence of God and with one another. Then we come to the second principle. Hannah models a right relationship with God. Not only were things right between she and her husband, but things were right between her and God. And that made all the difference. Imagine if she started barking back at Panina. You know, shut up. Don't talk to me like that. I can't have kids. So get a grip, you know. She didn't respond in that way at all. Because her relationship with God was such that she could withstand with gentleness and graciousness what was going on in the midst of that conflict. Godly mothers grow best in the soil of a godly marriage, a loving marriage, a supportive marriage, a sympathetic husband. But then she had the heavenly relationship, the right relationship with God. She knew where to go when she had this problem. The problem was too big for her. The problem was too big for her husband. So instead she went to God, said, God, I need your help. And there's six principles that we can see in what was going on here. <coughs> with Hannah and her relationship with God. The first principle, Hannah was a woman of passion. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, she wanted a child desperately. She often wept, she fasted, she prayed. Her heart was broken over the fact she couldn't have a child. She wanted a child to give to God. You see, it wasn't to fulfill, fulfill her own need. Oh, I want to have a kid so I can kick, put her on my lap or put him on my lap and I can show him up. No. God, if you give me this child, I'll give the child back to you. That was her passion, her desire. <coughs> a godly mother is not a reluctant mother. It's a mother who says, God, give me this gift and I'll give it back to you. I'll give you all I can. A truly godly mother longs to have a child but also longs to give that child back to God. But Hannah had no children, so she weeps. Her heart is unfulfilled. She had a passion for God and wanted to give him her best. She was also a woman of prayer. Her life was characterized by prayer. Look at what the scripture says. 1 Samuel 1, 9 to 14. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, so they had gone to make a sacrifice at the temple, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, or the priest, was sitting in his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. So here they are in the temple, and Hannah suddenly stands up. We wonder what's, gonna, what's going on here. And she makes a vow. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery... And remember me, and don't forget your servant, but give me a son, that I will offer him to you, O Lord, all the days of his life he will spend with you. <coughs> what he, she was promising is that he would become a, uh, a Nazarite. Now, in Jewish culture, certain boys and young men would be promised to the temple to work as a Nazarite. And uh, in a lot of families, offered their sons to go become a Nazarite for a short period of time. And then they'd come back and get involved in the family business and whatever. There are only three guys in history of, throughout the Old, Old and New Testament that became Nazarites for life. That was John the Baptist, Samson, and Sin. Pretty interesting, right? That Hannah was saying, God, if you give me a child, 
I'm going to give them back to you. And not just for a while. He's going to be yours. To use for your glory. To work in the temple. Do whatever is going to bring honor to you. <coughs> so she, she's a woman of prayer. <coughs> it tells her, as she kept praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Thank you, Andy. <coughs> so there she is standing in the temple and she's praying, but no words are coming out. There's no sound. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli tries to become like the priest, the spiritual leader. He's you know, the big guy and he goes over and says, uh, are you drunk? I mean, uh, your, your lips are moving, but you're not talking. What's going on? Are you, are you drinking wine? Too much wine? You got to get off that stuff. I mean, pretty terrible that a priest couldn't identify when a woman was going through hurt and pain and sorrow and weeping and then assume, oh, she must be drunk. No woman should act like that in the temple. In fact, this guy, Eli, was kind of a fat slob. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that, but he was the main priest in the temple. And we find out later that when his two sons got into big trouble, he uh, was standing and he got so shook up because his sons, that he fell over, he broke his neck and he died. So the, the guy couldn't hardly stand. Uh, and he was trying to be a, a counselor at this point and says, hey, why are you drinking? How long are you going to stay drunk? Put your wine away. Put away your wine. No, just get off the, the beer, the, the wine. She was not concerned about her appearance. She didn't care what people thought. Her heart was breaking. So she, she gets into the temple and she begins to pour out her heart, totally dependent on God. Lord, I, just, I need you. You're the only one who can help me. She knew where to go when she had a problem. She was a woman of prayer. Third principle, Han Hannah was a woman of promise. It tells us in 1 Samuel verse 11, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you'll only look on your servant who's in misery, remember him, don't forget your servant, give her a son. And Lord, I'll give him to you all the days of his life. And not a razor will ever be used on his head. That's how we know she's promising that her son's going to become a Nazarite. And only three men in history became Nazarites for life. Samson, you remember what happened to him? His hair got cut. And that was one of the ways in which he had gone against the promise and vow that he made. He also got drunk, so Nazarites were not allowed to drink. So there were only... Three Certain things that a Nazarite agreed to, and Sam, um, Hannah was promising, my son will become one who works in your temple, Lord. And a razor will never touch his head. Because they weren't interested in their appearance. They were solely concentrated on, on serving the Almighty God. And that's what Hannah wanted for her son. This is her promise, to present her child to God. And that really is what a godly mother does. Godly mother says, Lord, you've given me this child. I present it to you. And we've done that here in the church. I've seen some of you mothers saying, I'm going to dedicate my child to you, God. God, you'll, I'll, you'll bless them and help them and, and help me be a good parent. She was also a mother of uh, a woman of purity. Eli was the highest priest sitting off on one side. He was watching people as they came in the temple. And... Uh, he watches her as she's pouring out her heart. She's not speaking. And it says, as he, she kept on praying, Eli observed her mouth. Strange, he couldn't tell the difference between her weeping and thinking that she was drunk. Put your mind, wine away. He goes on to say, verse 12 to 18, Hannah responds. And she's not upset. Like, this priest has pretty much called her a drunk, right? And she could have snapped back, what are you talking about? I'm pouring out my heart. I'm, I'm going through this grief. But instead, she responds in a very gentle way. She says, not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've, been, I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant to a wicked woman. Or, or don't, don't assume that I'm a wicked woman. So in the original language, this idea of a wicked woman is somebody who's been a 
idolater who's gone and, and laughed and, and made a ruckus in, in, a, in a spiritual or a, a religious setting. And so she says, no, I'm not, I'm not that kind of woman. Don't assume that. I've been praying out of great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. So she's pouring out her heart and, and then she responds in a very pure way, not a defensive way. Not so, my Lord. I really have a desire that God would answer my request. And in a, in a way, Eli gives a kind of an apology. Not really. He should have said, I'm sorry. But he said, well, go in peace. Whatever you ask, I hope God gives it to you. So she was a woman of virtue. She was a godly woman. She was a pure woman. She had a passion for God's best. She prayed in faith to God. She makes a promise, and now we find she's a woman of purity. Then we come to one other principle. Hannah was a woman of patient faith. The next characteristic comes in verse 18. I love this. She says, uh, she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something. So here she is pouring out her heart, and once she gives it to the Lord, she gets up and she says, okay, now I can go and eat. So she, by faith, believed God was going to take, take care of things. That's what faith is. It's saying, God, here's the problem. Here's the situation. I'm going to trust you for it. And I'm going to get back to, to business. You know, I'm going to get back to life. That's exactly what she did. She now could eat. She wasn't sad like before. Why? Because she was a woman of patient faith. What else could she do? Now, there's some people that would say, oh, I don't know about this. Why, why doesn't it happen tomorrow? I mean, or why, why hasn't it happened yet? And, and all that anxiety, that's not patience. That's not faith. But she exhibits patience and faith. She walks away. She eats. She's no longer sad. And then the Lord gives her the desire of her heart. We're going to look at that in a moment. Verses 19 and 20. But I want you just to remember now where we've been. She's a woman of passion. She's a woman of prayer. She's a woman of promise. Believing that God, if you do this, I vow to give my child back to you. She's a woman of purity. She's not combative when people come at her. She's gentle and kind. And she's a woman of faith. But last I want to point out, she's a woman of praise. If you go to... 1 Samuel chapter 2 is one of the most beautiful prayers in Scripture. For about 10 verses, we see Hannah praying to the Lord, just calling out to God about how good He is, how faithful He is, how gracious He is. So if you want to read a great prayer, or, or even you women want to see a prayer that a, a godly mother uses in talking to God, find it in 1 Samuel chapter 2. It says... Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord my horn is lifted up. Now back in those days, they had a big horn to express the, uh, come to worship, come to glorify God. So my horn is lifted up, my mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There's no one holy like you, Lord. There's no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. She goes on and on, ten verses, talking like this, giving thanks and adoration and praise. So there's a pattern. She had a right relationship with her husband. They shared worship. They shared love. They shared feelings. She had a right, right relationship with God. She was passionate about what she desired. She was a prayer, a prayer warrior. She was a woman who believed in the promise of God. She was a woman of purity, of faith, and of praise. But lastly, I want you to notice... Hannah models a right relationship in the home. We're coming on the home stretch here, so hang with me. Finally, she had this right relationship in her home. Let me read to you a couple of verses here. 1 Samuel 1, 21, 22. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, isn't she supposed to go and take her children and go to the temple and do what they're supposed to do? 
No, she, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I'll take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. I kind of got embarrassed uh, when I read this because when we had kids, I was like always saying to Barb, you got to take the kids to church. We got to go to church. Bring the kids. I mean, you can't stay home. But Hannah goes, wait a minute. I'm going to stay home and take care of this kid. Make sure that they're... Now, back in those days, it would have taken about a week and a half to get to the temple. So they'd be uh, almost 10 days, 12 days traveling, walking. And then they'd spend a week there doing the sacrifice and then another week coming. So it would have been a kind of an arduous thing to be carrying a baby and trying to nurse the baby along that tra uh, trip. But I just want you to notice that Hannah, she loved God, but then she also saw her responsibility to make sure her baby was taken care of. She wanted to nurture her son so that one day he would be given back to the temple and he would serve the Lord forever, you know, the rest of his life. So we go back to verse 19. I'm sorry, we'll go to verse 23 and 28. Her husband says, do what seems best to you. Stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at the home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah, which is a little container of flour, and a skin on, uh, full of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, so she's coming back to this priest, and she says to him, uh, pardon me, excuse me, uh, you may not remember me, but I'm the one who was here, I was, I was the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked him. So now I wanna give him to the Lord for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So Samuel stayed there, and he, as a little boy, he started to be groomed as a priest and uh, somebody who would work in the temple the rest of his life. And every once in a while, her mom would come that 10 days travel with a new robe that she had made for him, and then he'd put it because his body was growing, and she, she'd make the new robe, she'd go back, and a few months would go by, and she'd bring him another robe. So she cared for him, even though she had offered him to the Lord and wanted him to serve the Lord. She kept on caring for that relationship with her son, making sure that he was uh, well taken care of, even in the temple. What an amazing thing that Samuel had that kind of mom and that prepared him to become one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. Started Israel to get back on the straight and narrow path. We're told in 1 Samuel 2, verses 18 and 19. Here's what happened later as a result of Hannah's faithfulness and the way she cared for her son. We're told that Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod or a robe. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him and when she went up with her husband to offer the annual, uh, annual sacrifice, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife saying, may the Lord give you children by this woman to take play, uh, the place of the one she's prayed for and give it to the Lord. So your, your wife has given Samuel to the, to the temple to work in the temple. I just pray that God blesses you with more children so that you have children at home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. She never forgot her promise. She made a vow to the Lord. And yet she continued to take care of him. So a godly mother involves a right relationship with her husband, a right relationship with God, and a right relationship in the home. Hannah had all of that. She honored God. She was a model for other mothers to follow. So my question to you this morning is, how does this apply to you? Based on this truth, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, ladies, are you a godly mom? Or are you preparing godly children to follow the Lord? Or are you preparing younger women to become godly mothers? To the men, 
Are you creating an environment in your home, in your marriage, where your wife can flourish and grow and become all that God wants her to be? Are you raising your kids who will get married and lead their children into godliness? To young people, are you honoring your mother? Now, I don't know how you feel about your mom, but you've got to remember your mom has sacrificed a lot. Maybe she do doesn't always come across in a gentle way, but you need to honor her and thank her for all that she does for you. No mom is perfect, but when they love the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the best gift they can give to you. Get you involved in the church and come and encourage you to be in church. So we're going to close our time, and I just would ask for those of you that need to take a rose and give it to your mom and say the words, Mom, I love you. Thank you for everything you've done for me. I encourage you to do that. And for the moms, I encourage you to be more like Hannah. And to the dads and husbands, I encourage you to be more like Elkanah. Don't get two wives, but I, I encourage you. I encourage you to, to be an honorable man and to be sensitive to your wife and model what it means to go to to the temple, to the place of worship. Let that become your legacy, your inheritance to your kids. I want to read this, you know, I opened by telling you a story or something that was written back in the 1800s. I found another tribute that someone had given to his mom and he wrote these words. So listen, and I'll, I'll finish with this. It was written uh, back about 30, 40 years ago, but here's what the man said. The young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked. Her guide said, yes, and the way is hard, and you will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy, and she would not believe that anything could be better than these years, so she played with the children. She gathered flowers for them along the way and bathed them, and the sun shone on them and life was good and the young mother cried nothing will ever be lovelier than this and then the night came a storm and the path was dark and the children shook with fear and cold and the mother drew them close and covered them with her mantle her love and the children said oh mom we're not afraid for you are near and no harm can come to us and the mother said nothing could be better than this even the brightest day for i've taught my children courage and then the morning came and there was a hill ahead and the children climbed and they grew weary and the mother was weary. But at all times she said to the children, a little patience and we'll get there. So the children climbed and when they reached the top, they said, we couldn't have done it without you, mom. And the mother, when she lay down that night, looked up at the stars and said, there's nothing that could be better than this. My children have learned strength in the face of hardship. Yesterday I gave them courage. Today I've given them strength. And then the next day came, strange clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war and hate and evil. The children groped and stumbled, and the mother said, Look up, lift up your eyes to the light. And the children looked and saw above the clouds an everlasting glory, and it guided them and brought them beyond the darkness. And that night mother talked of Jesus and said, This is the best day of all. For I have shown my children God. And the days went on, and the weeks and months and years passed by, and the mother grew old, and she was little and bent. But the children were tall and strong and walked with faith and in courage. And when they were on the way that was rough, they lifted her, and she was as light as a feather. And at last they came to a hill, and beyond the hill they could see a shining road and golden gates flung open. The mother said, I've reached the end of my journey, and now I know that the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk alone, and they can walk with God. And the children said, you will always walk with us, mother, even when you're gone through the gates to the Savior. And they stood and watched her as she went on alone, and the gates closed behind her, and they said, we cannot see her, but she is still with us. A mother like ours is more than a memory. She's given us a living legacy. She will always be on our minds and in our hearts.
Father in heaven, we've looked at uh, the story of Hannah.